Okay, we're going to start now. We're going to go till 11.30. We'll have an hour and a half lunch break. And I, do we have the restaurant list and stuff out there? At the registration table, if you want to leave here, there, you, you knew about the subway thing. Uh, and there's restaurants all over the place that, is, that are closed. Uh, so we'll resume then this afternoon at 1 o'clock, and we're going to go to 3. We have to stop at 3 sharp because we've got to be out of this room by 4. And maybe we'll ask you to, if somebody can stay around and help us get things cleaned up and stuff. And uh, so we'll kind of play it by ear as to how Jacob wants to do it this afternoon, maybe do a little Q&A. No, it, sorry, from 1.30 to 3, we're okay. Okay. But that, no, is that the session, that the time? 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock. 1, One o'clock, you have two hours. Okay, okay, okay. What we will do then, friends, we'll do a teaching on the last days, on the return of Christ, uh, which I've been asked to do, um, concerning the book on Pezzo and things like that. We'll do that for two hours. It'll be a long teaching for two hours at one o'clock. Okay, we'll do it for two hours. Um, be a long session. So be pre-advised, forewarned is forearmed. Can you go for two hours? I can go for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. <laughs> uh, so. We'll do the teaching on end time prophecy for the last session. What we'll do now in the 30, um, on, on the 57 uh, minutes we have, we'll do the question and answer now, okay? We'll do the question and answer now because we have to be finished by 11.30 for the lunch break. So what I would respectfully request is the following, that before we take general questions, you can find questions to what we talked about either this morning or last night. First those questions, then if there's any time left over, we can open it to other things. But the questions we want to have now are first of all pertaining to this morning's sessions or last night. The morning session we just did, I did at the request of the local church. I know some of you are already familiar with our teaching on this subject of spiritual gifts, but I did it at the request of the local believers here in Ohio, that's why I did it. But the next session will be a question and answer one, and then the final one will be on end time prophecy, the return of Jesus, with a particular emphasis on the rapture, okay? And at the end of this session, we'll also take an offering. So before you leave, let's take the offering, and then you can go to lunch. Okay. So. Okay. Again, if you'd like to come with us to Israel, our next Bible study tour is in April. Our next Bible study tour is in April. Once again, all of our tour guides are Israeli Jewish believers. You'll meet Israeli believers. You won't see a tourist Israel or a vacation package Israel or a devotional tour Israel. You'll see the real Israel. We go to archaeological digs and we study the word on God, of God on site where things happened from a Judeo-Christian perspective. I, of course, lead the tours. I speak Hebrew. And uh, it will be different than most tours. It's not for everybody, but if you want a Bible study tour, I've got to be honest, there's only two I could recommend. One is Arnold Fruchtenbaum's. If you have five weeks, Arnold's is really good if you have that kind of time and money. His are really good if you have that time and money. Most people don't. But if you do, I'd recommend his tour, hands down. And the other one is, in this country, ours. If the tour leader doesn't speak the language and has never lived there, it's not going to be as good. I'm just being honest with you. The guy's got to know the turf. You know what I mean? So if you'd like to come with us in April, we'd love to have you with us. Just a little bit of housekeeping so that everyone can hear your question and those on, that were live, stream, live streaming too can hear the question and the answer. If you have uh, a question, please stand up and we'll get the microphone to you as soon as we can. So let's start with the first question. Give me a second to get to you. Okay, can I just say one thing? I forgot to insert this in the previous session. Terminology is important. You always have to define our terms because different Christians can mean different things by the same term. I used the term loosely, charismania. I think it was coined by Chuck Smith, you know, charismatic extremism. The actual theological term for charismania, the actual theological term is neo-Montanism. The Montanists were charismaniacs in the early church after the time of the apostles. Uh, charismania is what you see today, this hyper-pentecostal stuff, the Toronto and the Pensacola and all Lakeland, all that lunacy. The theological term for that stuff is neo-Montanism. Neo-Montanism, okay? 
Again, you can call it charismania if you want to, but that's the proper, the proper term. All right, first question, please. Nice and loudly so everyone can hear you. Please stand if you have a question. First question is for Vicki. Um, you had talked about pre-tribulation rapture yesterday. A and bit, one of, yes. One of the main things that when I talk about that, uh, the proponents of pre-tribulation rapture use 2 Thessalonians 2.6 about the restrainer. Yes. And they say that when the Holy Spirit is taken out, then the church is taken out, and um, that's the rapture. Okay. Thank you for your question, first of all. What was your name again? Vicky. Vicky. Thank you, Vicky. Okay, let's understand this. The pre-tribulation people have a part of the truth. The pre-wrath people have a bigger chunk of the truth. One of the places they both go off to the best of my understanding, not that I'm so arrogant as to say I got it right and if you don't take a walk, you weigh it, but I'm convinced what I'm telling you is right, is this. It is the Holy Spirit who restrains. There are three things that restrain the power of Satan now. One is the church preaching the gospel. The true church preaching the gospel. But in an age of compromise and of spiritual and doctrinal degeneration, the true gospel is being preached less and less. True gospel is being preached less and less. The blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. We do not atone in purgatory for our own. The gospel of Rome is a false gospel. A gospel of works is a false gospel. There are many false gospels today. Social gospels are false. Any kind of gospel based on religion is false. Remember, many people, countless people, have gone to hell because of religion. Nobody has ever gone to heaven because of religion. Not a single soul has ever gone to heaven because of religion. But countless people have gone to hell because of religion. It doesn't matter what religion it is. Could be liberal Protestantism, Roman Catholicism, Talmudic Judaism, Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, occult Buddhism, Islam. Take your pick. People will say today, all religions lead to the same place. I agree, they lead to the pit of hell. That's right. Nobody ever went to heaven because of a religion. Many people went to hell because of religion. You can only go to heaven because of the completed work of Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. That's the only way. If anybody is teaching some other gospel, forget it. The gospel's preaching by a faithful church restrains evil. Now this relates in part to what we call in Greek arche, in Hebrew rashiot, better translated principalities. Some people describe it as territorial spirits. Territorial spirits is a description, but it's not what it is. For instance, once higher criticism came out of Tübingen University in Germany, and liberal Protestantism emerged out of 19th century German rationalism, when Christianity was rewritten as a 19th century German rationalist religion, okay, and, and liberal theology came, became in, in, into prominence. This began in Germany. The Pietists were gone, the Moravians were gone, any conservative Lutherans were gone. What happened to Germany? They reverted to their ancient Teutonic war gods, didn't they? They just did what they always did before they were Christian. They killed everybody, okay? It's, it's, it's the same thing. Well, you can see that in the Celtic culture and, and, and anywhere. The ancient demonic powers will always come back into play. Now, unfortunately, again, the Neo-Montanists have gotten into this binding and loosing stuff without knowing what they're talking about, but there is demonic powers on back of these religious seductions. Ultimately, Antichrist will come to power, and one of the reasons he will come to power is the true gospel will not be being preached by the faithful church in any wide degree. Second thing that restrains evil, human government. Human government restrains evil. God ordained human government with Noah. Whether you like politicians or not, 
I liked politicians, especially when I got them on a bullseye in them. <laughs> I can't stand most of them, but I pray for them. Because if they are not being influenced by my prayers, they will be influenced by something much more sinister. <laughs> if they are not influenced by our prayers, if evil is not restrained by our prayers working through human government, that human government is going to be influenced by something much, much worse. Third, is the operation of the Holy Spirit the way he has functioned since the day of Pentecost. He convicts the world of sin concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. Okay? In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was only for certain people at certain times. Patriarchs, judges, high priests, kings, and prophets. Since the day of Pentecost, it is for all who are born again. But something else. The Holy Spirit was poured out on Pentecost, on Jesus working through the church to convict the world of sin. A time will come when the Antichrist ascends power with the false prophet, when those three things will cease to function as restrainers of evil. Work while you have the light. Night will come, no man can work. The true gospel will no longer be proclaimed in the way it is now. There is something called the gospel of the kingdom. That's more complicated. We'll talk about that in a later session. But the gospel as we've known it will not be proclaimed. Work while you have the light. Night will come, no man can work. Just like God's hand closed the door of Noah's ark, he's going to close it again. Second, human government will be given into the hand of Antichrist. He will control the world's religious system, the world's economic system, and the world's political system. He will control it, essentially. The third is the function of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 20, now pay attention. In Acts chapter 20, when Jesus died and rose from the dead, he breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Remember? At, yeah, in John 20. At that point, they were regenerate. At that point, they were born again. The Holy Spirit indwelt them. However, he told them, go to Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit. Although the Holy Spirit indwelt the people of God who'd been purchased by Jesus, he had not been poured out on the church. The church was not united and empowered. The world was not yet being convicted of righteousness, sin, and judgment. As he is in the age of grace, that's how he functions. Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. The Holy Spirit will never be taken from the hearts of God's people. But he will be taken from the world. He will no longer convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. In the last seven years of history, by the lunar calendar, God will operate the way he did in the Old Testament. His functions and his focus will return primarily to Israel and the Jews. That's first of all. Secondly, grace has come to an end. It's going to be the God of wrath and judgment. Same God, different kind of covenantal relationship. That is why you see the judgments in the book of Exodus, still commemorated in the Paschal Seder. Choshek, darkness, blood, dam, frogs, fardaya. You see those same judgments in the book of Revelation again, don't you? The way God behaved in the Old Testament is the way he's going to behave at that period. Grace will be over. The Spirit of God will not be taken from the hearts of true believers but it will be taken from the world. And the church will no longer be empowered to perform its mission the way it is now. There was a gap period between the ascension and Pentecost, wasn't there? The church didn't exist. Believers existed, but they had no power. At that time, the son of perdition was identified. 
there's only two people called the son of perdition, Judas and the Antichrist. Whenever you see something about Judas, the Holy Spirit is telling us something about the Antichrist. Read the book, Shadows of the Beast. They're both into money. They're both called the son of perdition with a definite article. When John describes Antichrist in his epistle, he describes Antichrist in the character of Judas. They went out from among us, but they were not really of us. Remember? Additionally, while many people have been demon-possessed, there are only two people Satan-possessed. Concerning Judas, the son of perdition, it says, and Satan entered him. The way that Satan dwelt in Judas, Satan will indwell the Antichrist. Now, this is a complicated issue. You can get the book, Shadows of the Beast. Okay. At that point... After the ascension, Jesus went, they're waiting for the Spirit. At that point, they knew who the son of perdition was, but the church didn't exist in any institutional or organized sense. It was not empowered. They were just there waiting. The converse happens. The apostles had the Holy Spirit, but the world did not. You understand? The converse happens. The same as Jesus went and sent the Spirit. The Holy Spirit goes and sends Jesus. There's a gap period. That is the shattering of the power of the holy people as Daniel referred to it. Isaiah, hide yourself away, my people, to the indignation is past, the abomination of desolations. The Holy Spirit restrains evil. The three things which to a degree suppress evil now, human government, the preaching of the gospel, and the conviction of the Holy Spirit, those things will not be operational at that point. It is the Holy Spirit that restrains evil. What these people do is they equate the removal of the Holy Spirit with the rapture because they are cessationists. They don't believe in spirit baptism or things like this. In other words, for somebody's eschatological, eschatology to be right, and I use the term eschatology sparingly, for somebody's understanding of end time prophecy to be right, their pneumatology must be right. Unless you understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit, you will not understand end time prophecy. Jesus goes and sends the Spirit the Spirit goes and sends Jesus. The apostles already had the Spirit before Pentecost, indwelling, but the world did not. Well, the world is not going to have it again. It will only be for the hearts of God's people. It is the Holy Spirit who does the suppressing, not an angel. Does that answer your question? Sorry for the complicated answer, but that's why we do a QA session. <laughs> Microphone here, please. We got a question in the back. We got a question in the okay. back here first, then. Is it? Uh, you, you were talking about Louder, the, please. You're talking about the uh, grace or the gifts. Could you explain about them? Some people think they're at will. Okay, good question. Thank you very much for that question. That's an excellent question. Turn with me, please, to the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 5, verse 17. What's your name, brother? Donald. Donald. Thank you, Donald. Just the end of verse 17. The dunamis, the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. Do you see that? At the pool of Bethesda in John 5, Jesus only healed one paralytic, the one his father told him. He made reference to Elisha. There were many lepers. Only the one was sent to the widow. Only the one. You know. The gifts of healing may be operational. We can pray for a sick person. We can anoint the sick person with oil. We should do that. God uses medical science, but never swallow an aspirin without praying first. 
Whenever you go to the world for help, be it the world's legal system, the world's healthcare system, the world's education system, always tread cautiously. <laughs> You're on enemy's turf. God can use those things, but make sure Jesus is with you when you do it. Okay? We can always pray for a sick person and anoint them with oil. But if you're going to command the sick person to get out of a deathbed, if you're going to command in the name of Jesus a cancer to disappear, if you're going to command a corpse to get off a slab, the Holy Spirit has to come on you and be telling you to do that in that given situation. It's the same as a prophecy. You can't go around prophesying. That's clairvoyance. The Holy Spirit must come on you in that given instance and give you that prophecy. You cannot go around praying in tongues. If it's a real tongue, the Holy Spirit must come on you in that situation. No charismatic gift can operate unless the Holy Spirit comes on you in that individual situation to do it. You understand? We cannot do it at will. We can only do it at his will. Paul left somebody sick in Troas, didn't he? Luke still practiced medicine, didn't he? Well, that's because they didn't have any faith. That's rubbish. That's rubbish. For any gift of the Spirit to operate, the Holy Spirit must be coming on them. I could stand up here and expound things that may be factually true. They may be theologically correct. But if you've been saved for any amount of time and you listen to somebody at a pulpit, no matter who they are, you will know by the Holy Spirit, is it the Holy Spirit speaking to this person or is it just them? <laughs> I can only disseminate information in my own strength. Only the Holy Spirit can turn that information into knowledge. You understand? Only the Holy Spirit can turn that information into knowledge. I can just give you data. I can be out there goofing around, joking with people. But as soon as I stand up here, this is not about me anymore. I have to pray, Lord, Lord, it's got to be from you. It's no good. You'll know when your spirit is at the spirit. You cannot exercise any gift at will. He exercises the gifts or causes them to be exercised at his will. Does that answer your question, Donald? Thank, don't call me, sir. I work for a living. I tell people. <laughs> oh, we've got a lady here first. Um, I have two questions. I have, I'll give um, you one, and if we have time, we'll come back. Okay. Nice and loudly, though. Um, the, the dynamic equivalent um, is okay. what they've used as an excuse to do the living Bible and um, the message. Those are not dynamic equivalents. Those are paraphrases. But they use the phrase that they are dynamic equivalent. They may claim to be, but they're paraphrases. They're not dynamically equivalent. Okay. And why should I pray for the peace of Jerusalem? First of all, shalu shalom Yerushalayim. You should pray for the peace of Jerusalem, which literally in Hebrew means to prayerfully inquire into it, its welfare. You should pray for the peace of Jerusalem because God said to. <laughs> No, what the peace of Jerusalem will be when Jesus comes back in Zechariah chapter 12. However, I will tell you about the peace of Jerusalem now. I lived in Israel for many years. I lived in Jerusalem. I went to Hebrew University as a kid. Every time I led a Jew to Christ, or any time I led a Muslim to Christ, there was peace in Jerusalem. <laughs> I've seen Jew and Arab reconciled in Christ through a common faith in Jesus when the Jew stops believing the lies of the Talmud and the Arab stops believing the lies of the Koran, we can work for the peace of Jerusalem and pray for the peace of Jerusalem now through evangelism. It's called the gospel of peace. Shod your feet with the shoes of the gospel of peace. 
You want to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, pray that Jews and Arabs will get saved. Ultimately, when Jesus comes back, there will be peace in Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, I guarantee it. But in the meantime, we have to work for the peace of Jerusalem. That's evangelism. That's praying for the salvation of Jews and Arabs. Abraham's children after the flesh. Okay. Yeah, please. <coughs> yeah, Jacob, just a quick question. I have a lot of folks like Beth Moore, and they don't want to be, <laughs> sorry to make you flinch. Um, uh, Keep they, it they, clean. <laughs> they, they, don't, they don't want to uh, uh, be uh, associated with Latter-day Rain, but they're calling for a, great, a second great outpouring now uh, uh, in rain. Now, there is a famine for the word, that's for sure, but I only find, I've only found great apostasy in the end times. The, great, the second great outpouring is on the Jewish people, correct? Uh, in the tribulation period, according to Zechariah. Okay, Zachariah. your first thing is, I'm against getting drunk in Moriarty's tavern. Therefore, I'm going to get drunk in Clancy's pub. <laughs> <laughs> you can still do a wrong thing by another name. <laughs> it's substance, not label. They can say they're not, but when they're teaching and doing the same things, they are. The latter day reign. Romans 11 tells us, Romans 11 is the prism through which we look at the rest of the prophecies concerning Israel and the church, Israel's relationship to the church. The first Christians were Jews and the last Christians will be Jews. The first harvest of Israel were the 3,000 saved on the day of Pentecost, Hag Shavuot. It is calculated by the rabbis, the sages, that the day the Torah was given was Hag Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, which is called Pentecost. The Torah was given that day. We're told in the Mishnah, Jewish history, not scripture, that a whirlwind was heard from heaven, and there, based on the table of nations in Genesis 10, there were 70 languages heard when the Torah was given. Hence, as a sign to Jews, when the Holy Spirit was given, the same phenomena happened with the tongues. However, when the law was given, 3,000 fell. On the day of Pentecost, 3,000 were saved. You understand? It's showing the relationship between law and grace. Just as there was an outpouring of the Spirit on Israel and the Jews, and there was a first harvest, Israel has two harvest seasons and two rain seasons, former latter rain. What is the rain? Isaiah 44, 3. Look at Isaiah 44, verse 3. Can somebody read it nice and loudly? Isaiah 44, verse 3. What does it say? Ishayahu Hanavi. water upon him that is thirsty and, and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. The outpouring of the rain is a picture of the outpouring of the spirit according to Isaiah 44 3. The water goes in, I explained this many times, the rain goes into the water table and forms maim hayim, living water. Hence Jesus said I will give you living water but this he spoke of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit was poured out on Israel and the Jews in the beginning of the church, and it will be poured out on Israel and the Jews at the end of the age. The first Christians were Jews, and the last Christians were Jews. Concerning the Gentile nations, I do not deny that the gospel will be preached, but it's the gospel of the kingdom. More about that in the next session. Concerning the nations, the scriptures speak far more about an end-time apostasy and falling away and rebellion than they do about an end-time revival. <laughs> they speak far more about an end-time falling away and rebellion and apostasy into reprobation and disbelief, unbelief than it does speak about an end-time revival, far more. You are correct in what you are saying. Joel's prophecy is largely Judeo-centric. I don't say exclusively, but certainly largely, it is Judeo-centric. Okay? Yes, sir. I've been thinking about this a long time <clears throat> in the light of uh, a couple of verses. 
I think the saddest text in the scriptures is when Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith in the world? Yes. And, you know, considering that eight people got out of uh, Noah's flood, and Jesus saying things like, narrow is the gate, and few there be that find it. But yet, the Bible also talks about almost like it's easy to get saved. You know, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, et cetera, et cetera. So, which is it? Are we, is it bleak or is it not bleak? Anybody can be a mother or a father. A giraffe can do it. But not anybody can be a parent. <laughs> it's easy to be a mother or a father. That's purely biological. But to be a parent, <laughs> that's a life investment. Anybody can be a convert. But he didn't say to make converts. He said to make disciples. There's a big difference. Converts, read the parable of the sower and the seed. <laughs> As I always say, evangelism minus discipleship equals zero. More specifically, dealing with your question, what's your name, please? Frank. Frank. It's like this, Frank. When Jesus came the first time, despite the fact that God had been dealing with the Jews for 2,000 years, from the time of Abraham and the patriarchs to the time of Jesus was just as long a time as from the time of Jesus to us today. Think about that. He'd been dealing with Israel to prepare Israel for the first coming of Jesus for 2,000 years. There about it. The history of Israel from Abraham to first Jew to Jesus was just as long as the age of the church from, from the time of Jesus to now. Despite that, 2,000 years of work and investment and of history, despite having the scriptures, despite it being a fundamental tenet of their faith that the Messiah would come, only a faithful remnant of Israel was ready for his first coming. Ditto. After 2,000 years, despite having the scriptures, despite two millennia of investment, preparation, the same as only a faithful remnant of Israel was ready for his first coming, only a faithful remnant of Christendom is going to be ready for his return. Same thing. Does that answer your question? Okay, I'll explain that. I will explain that. It doesn't say work for, it says work out. The way I explain it usually is like this. There was a little boy who lived in uh, Elyria, Ohio. I had a friend when I was a little boy named Donna. She was from Elyria, Ohio. I felt sorry for the kid. <laughs> Anyway, this little boy from Ohio, his hobby was building model ships and model airplanes out of plastic models. He loved doing it. But there was a new model of, a, uh, you know, uh, an aircraft carrier, the Nimitz. It was about this long. The thing was expensive. He didn't make enough money in his paper route to buy it. But the kid's old man knew the kid wanted it, so for his birthday, although the kid did not have the guilt to buy it for himself, his father purchases it for a birthday present and gives it to him. The kid is enthralled. Look at this. It's the Nimitz. Okay. He couldn't have bought that. He didn't have the money. His father got it for him. It was a free gift. He didn't earn it. It was just his father's love. But the kid had to open it up, read the instructions, take out the airplane glue, and assemble it. He didn't work for it, but he had to work it out. Salvation is a gift. We've got to read the instructions <laughs> and act on what we were given. We don't work for it, we work it out. It's a gift! 
but we have to put it into practical operation by our own application and diligence in the fear of the Lord. Okay? Okay. That answers the question. Too. Next question, please. Hi, my name is Carla. Hello, I'm here Carla. from South Dakota. Jesus loves you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he does. I'm only um, kidding. From what I have seen from the people that are being called out, that are seeing the error in the church, one of the biggest con points of confusion for them is what is the biblical definition of being baptized in the Holy Spirit, and do you need to speak in tongues to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? We already answered the question about tongues yesterday. There is a biblical gift of tongues, but most of what you hear today is not real. And it is not initial evidence that cannot be exegetically proven through the scripture, which is not to deny an authentic biblical gift of tongues. One time in my life, and only once, I was in the Middle East, and I spoke a sentence to somebody I was witnessing to, a Jewish person, and it was a word of knowledge about them, their background, that I could not have known, and it was in a language they understood and I did not. It brought conviction that person got saved, and now, well over 35 years later, they're still walking with Yeshua, Jesus. Happened one time. Now what I do in my prayer closet, that's between me and the Lord. But if I do it audibly in a church, it has to be understood, either by interpretation or it has to be understood by you know, vernacular means. Otherwise, it's not edifying to the body. The gifts are given to build up the body. Tongues can only build up yourself unless it's understood by the people or somebody. Okay. Only happened to me one time. Never happened since. May never happen again. Only one time. But the fruit of it was there. <laughs> you know, it's still there. I was in a meeting in London with my wife. My wife and myself speak Hebrew to each other. We speak English also to each other, but we speak Hebrew to each other. There was a young woman from Mauritius in front of us. Did not know we were on back of her. She spoke English and French, Creole. My wife and myself both heard her praying in Hebrew. I said to her, I've made a better debrief. What? You can speak Hebrew. Very rare. I was at a prayer meeting in Israel, and a guy named Yossi came. He spoke Hebrew, he spoke Arabic, and he spoke some English. He spoke English, but not fluently. He didn't speak Spanish. He did not know that I speak Spanish. And I was there with a lady named Frida who spoke Ladino, which is a Jewish dialect of Spanish. And her and I would speak Spanish to each other, or I'd speak to her in Puerto Rican, she'd answer me in Ladino. <laughs> and Yossi prayed beautifully like one of the Psalms. But there's only been a couple of times I've heard stuff like that, you understand? Most of what I've heard is shambara, 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 shambara. I do not deny what is in Scripture. But we cannot exegetically prove, as we looked at last night, that it is initial evidence. The day of Pentecost, they cannot prove that they all spoke in tongues because there were Judeans there as well as Galileans who had the same language, Aramaic. You can get the tape from last night if you weren't here. Now, what is spirit baptism? Look with me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 1, I do not want you, brethren, to be unaware that our fathers were all under the cloud and passed through the sea. The cloud, the Shekinah, Spirit baptism, see the water, water baptism. One faith, one baptism, but there's two aspects to it, the spirit and the water, okay? 
Well, what does water baptism do? Sacramentalism, as taught by the Roman Church and certain other churches, and by the Church of Christ, which is basically cultic, it's called Campbellism. But there are people who profess to be evangelicals who believe in this doctrine of baptismal regeneration, that the ritual saves you. It's false. You do not get baptized to get saved. You get baptized because you've been saved. We've been baptized into his death. What do you do with the corpse? You bury it. Okay. If you're a saved Christian and you've been baptized in water, you've been baptized, next time you drive by a cemetery or a funeral parlor or a mortuary or a morgue or a hearse, it doesn't concern you. Your funeral is over. It's finished. You've, you, you've had your, your funeral as a past event. You don't die, you go to sleep. That is for unsaved people. Talit at the kumi, the little girl's asleep, get up. Lazarus is asleep, get up. You, your funeral, my funeral, our funeral is over. It's a past event. You've had your funeral. Don't think it, doesn't, it doesn't concern us. Only good thing about a funeral is unsaved people become aware of their own mortality and it can be an opportunity to preach the gospel because they're more spiritually impressionable than they might otherwise be. Otherwise, <laughs> there's, there's no point in it. It doesn't concern us, your funeral is over. Going under the water is co-burial with Christ. Coming out is co-resurrection. What baptism does, water baptism now, it takes a objective truth and makes it a subjective experience. It takes something that is already a positional truth and makes it an experiential truth. Okay? One faith, one baptism. Spirit baptism works the same exact way. When somebody is born again, they're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Spirit baptism is taking something that's objectively true and making it experiential. It's a subjective experience. Now let me develop this further because it can be a source of great confusion and misunderstanding. Jack and Jill meet in church, with a youth group or something like that. Jack and Jill are attracted. Jack and Jill fall in love. Jack and Jill get engaged. Jack and Jill get married. So in the church, the preacher says, I now pronounce you man and wife. In the eyes of the church, they are now one. In the eyes of the law, the state of Ohio, they are now one because they've entered into a contract legally. In the eyes of their family and in the eyes of the witnesses, they are one because they have exchanged vows. And above all, in the eyes of God, they are one because they made the vow to God. Remember, marriage vows are not just to each other, it's to the Lord. He drives me crazy, I can't take him anymore. She's driving me nuts, I can't take her anymore. You drive me nuts, but I'm not getting rid of you, and you're not getting rid of them. <laughs> I've never considered divorce. Murder weekly, but divorce... <laughs> <laughs> My daughter met a nice Jewish boy in her church in London. She married him, expecting our first grandchild. Thank God she didn't wind up with a bum like me. But anyway, Jack and Jill are now one. God says they're one above all. The church says they're one. The law says they're one. And not least of all, Jack and Jill say they are one. I now present you, Mr. and Mrs. Jack and Jill. You may kiss the bride. There they go down the aisle. When they walk out the church, they are objectively one. But they go away on their honeymoon and they consummate their marriage. Objectively, they have already been one. 
But not until they go on their honeymoon does the objective truth become a subjective experience. Let's take a more biblical illustration. Somebody snuffs it. You can embalm a corpse. You can go and look at the stiff and they're all decked out in their Sunday best. Oh, yeah, you know, looks terrific. Yeah, you got a great embalmer. Look at him. <laughs> Objectively, they've checked out. Subjectively, they're still with us. Not until you put the remains into the grave until the day of resurrection has the objective reality that they snuffed it become a subjective reality. That's it. What baptism does is takes the objective truth and makes it a subjective experience, both water baptism and spirit baptism. You understand? An unbaptized Christian is like an unburied corpse. Well, in the Middle East, God said to bury them before the next sundown. God knew about microbes long before biomedical science did. <laughs> he knew about lividity. He knew about contagions coming from a corpse and so forth. Bury them quickly. Don't wait to get baptized. Once somebody is dead, bury the corpse. Once you get married, consummate the marriage. What are you waiting for? We're waiting for the right timing. How long have you been married? 31 years. <laughs> <laughs> How long have you been saved? I got saved two years ago last November. Somebody get a shovel. It's not normal not to bury a corpse. It's not normal not to consummate holy wedlock. It's not normal not to be baptized. If somebody does not get baptized, there's the question, are they really dead? Are they a new creation? However, we have this issue of water and spirit. Different people get saved in different ways. Baptism is the same. In Acts chapter 10, Cornelius and his family, they were born again, then they were baptized in the Spirit, then they were baptized in water. Okay. In Acts chapter 8, it was different. Somebody is baptized, saved, born again, then they're baptized, then the Samaritans are baptized in the Spirit, a different order. On the day of Pentecost, they got the package deal. The only order you don't have is somebody getting baptized without being saved, without being born again. Infant baptism is completely unscriptural. You wouldn't take a baby out of a crib and put her into a casket if it wasn't dead. We have three kinds of variations. Variations in sequence. Somebody might get saved, then they might get baptized in water, then they might get baptized in the Spirit. Some, another person might get saved, then they might get baptized in the Spirit, then they might get born again. Look at charismatics. In the charismatic movement that happened in the 80s, it began here in Ohio in large part, in the 70s and that, those people's second birth was their baptism of the Spirit, wasn't it? it was the <laughs> you have variations in sequence. You have variations in terminology. The gift of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, You have no fewer than five terms that all are virtually synonymous. Each one of those terms highlights a different aspect of spirit baptism, but they all refer to the same thing. You understand? 
They're all talking about the same thing, even though they all each is highlighting a different aspect of the same thing. The gift, the promise, the baptism, and so forth. So you have a variation in terminology. Thirdly, you have a variation in experience. I was baptized in the Spirit when I was water baptized. I came out of the water and the Spirit hit me and my life was different. It is not, it is not tongues that prove it. Remember, of all the churches that Paul had to remind of the Holy Spirit, there was one. It wasn't the confused Thessalonians or the legalistic Galatians. It was the charismatic Corinthians who had to be reminded that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of holiness. Haruaka Kodesh. The numatos hegios. The power to live a moral life. I'd been addicted to cocaine as a teenager in university. And I had gotten saved through the hippies, the Jesus movement, and I was in these weird groups that were cults, and I kept backsliding, backsliding, backsliding. In my life, it was spirit baptism that empowered me to live a holy life. That now Jesus, the reality, of, he was always there, but now I experienced a power that I've never taken cocaine since or cannabis since. Never, never. Other people, it could be something other. Me, it was, was, the, was the drugs. Other people could be sexual or whatever. It doesn't matter. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the empowerment to live a moral life. And secondly, it's the empowerment to be anointed or commissioned for the ministry God has called you to. <laughs> you can see some preachers, they're not baptized in the Spirit. They're just... <laughs> They're just information disseminators. But there's no <laughs> it's not that they're not animated or anything. It's just that they're not anointed. They're, they're, the spirit is suppressed. It empowers us to live a moral life, but it empowers us for the ministry that God's called us to. Anointing, if you want to call it that. Some people, there'll be tongues. Other times, there won't. Some people, there will be fireworks. Other times, there will not be. In my case, I think the Lord said, this kid's so burned out, I better give him a bolt of lightning. This kid's, <laughs> this kid's freak. He's been on acid too long. <laughs> That's just the way it is. The problem happens when somebody takes their sequence or their pet terminology or their experience, or some combination, and makes it a template for everyone else. Brother, have you had the second blessing? <laughs> Let's go back to Jack and Jill. They walk out of the church, they have a nice reception, they go by the studio for the photographs, and the limousine takes them to the airport for their honeymoon in Hawaii, and they consummate their marriage. She... They say, that was fantastic. Maybe 25 years from now, we'll have a second honeymoon and do it again. <laughs> have you had the second blessing? There is no second blessing. There is the third, a fourth, and a fifth. Look with me, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 4. Verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Spirit. Who? The same people who were filled with the Spirit when the place was shaken on Pentecost. That wasn't a second blessing, that was a third. It's like marital romance. When you consummate a marriage, there may be something special about the first time by mere virtue of the fact it's the first time. But over time, marital romance should get better. So should a spirit-filled life. It's not a second blessing or a third. One baptism, many fillings. Everybody understand? It's multiple. Be filled with it. <laughs> now, I want to just say one more thing because we have to stop soon. I have known churches. 
I knew a brethren church, strict brethren. They would have professed to be cessationist. And the senior elder had the gift of the word of knowledge. He knew things by the Holy Spirit, but because of the doctrinal teaching and emphasis of his church, he didn't know it was the word of knowledge, but he had the word of knowledge. The gift of the word of knowledge operated through him. Uh, sorry, it was the word of wisdom. The word of wisdom operated through that brother. He would have said, no, we don't believe these things ended with the apostles. He had the word of wisdom. I've been in many Pentecostal and charismatic meetings where people would stand up and speak a lot of gibberish in King James English and call it a prophecy, and it wasn't. There are people practicing gifts of the Spirit they think that are not even authentic, and there are people doing it who don't know what it is because of ignorance and a lack of right teaching. You understand what I'm saying? It's not a second blessing. It's a third, a fourth, and a fifth. Yeah, there could be something special about the first time, but it's ongoing. It's a spirit-filled life. Don't let anybody, and don't you, take your experience in terms of a sequence or terminology or the way it happened to you and try to make a template out of it. The 120 prayed in tongues. It doesn't say the 3,000 did. <laughs> they have to read that into the text, asegetically. Do you understand? Now that's the nutshell version. It's much longer, but I hope that clears up some things. That put you on the right whatever does that ex explain things okay jake i've totally confused you the holy spirit always indwells us but if you're going to prophesy or pray in tongues or something like that the Holy Spirit must additionally, is always in you, must come on you. It's two different words in Greek. Must come on you. I showed you, one is Luke 5, 17. The power of the dunamis has to be there. There must be an empowering of the Holy Spirit in a given instance to practice the gift of the Spirit. 17, we read it. The empowerment of the Spirit must be there every time the manifestation occurs. Okay? Sorry? Indwelling, yes. There's a difference between the spirit indwelling and the spirit outpoured. John 20, breathe on them, receive the spirit. Then he says, go wait for the spirit. The New Testament draws a distinction between the spirit indwelling and the spirit outpoured. It's church tradition that has made them one. The New Testament does not teach that. If it was only once, there wouldn't have been a day of Pentecost because they got the Spirit in John 20. Yeah. When Jesus breathed on the apostles in John 20, he said, receive the Holy Spirit, didn't he? 2022. Yeah, please. John 20, 22. When he said this, he breathed on them. The word breath, pneuma, is where you get the word spirit. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. That's when they got the Holy Spirit. But then he said, go to Jerusalem and wait for the Spirit. What was he talking about? The Spirit indwelling and the Spirit outpoured. Two different things. One is for us. The other is for others. Okay. Jacob, I think we have one last question. We're going to extend your session a little bit because we promised the All right, uh, live streamers that we'd ask this question. It's a toughie. Oh, boy. <laughs> Are you saying that the belief 
in the tre- pre-trib rapture is the cause of the falling away? or are Absolutely there other, not. Or are Absolutely there, not. Or are there other causes of that in addition? And then your comments on that. The belief in the tri- pre-trib rapture is not the cause of the falling away. The cause of the falling away is rebellion against God and rejection of his word. It is the natural culmination of the church losing its first love. Pre-trib rapture has nothing whatsoever to do with as a causative factor in the apostasy or the falling away. There are many very godly people who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. I believe they're misguided on that point, but I have no doubt whatsoever that there are many people, people I know who love the Lord very much, who hold to a pre-trib position, even though the position is mistaken. I also believe, as we get closer to the time of Jesus, these people who believe it, the Holy Spirit is going to show them it's wrong. Many of them are doubting it already. Including many Calvary Chapel pastors I know are doubting it. That's not because of Jacob. It's because of the Holy Spirit showing them it's not right. Thank you very much. Uh, This will conclude the Q&A session. If you have other questions you'd like uh, Jacob to address, we may be able to sneak a couple into um, uh, an interview here later today we can put online. We have one other piece of business prior to breaking for lunch, so I'm going to ask uh, the ushers to come up to take an offering. Uh, just, in, just to keep in mind, be back here by 1 o'clock. There are several restaurants around, Subway's here. If you ordered for sub, at Subway, they should have things ready for you when you go to pick it up. Thank you very much, and um, we'll take the offering.